good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Shaila Andrabi, and I will be introducing uh, Imam Adil Zaid today. Um, it is my really big pleasure to introduce Adil because um, a year and a half back, I was the person who um, basically started the campaign to hire a Muslim chaplain at the Claremont Colleges. Um, <laughs> so, um, of course, uh, a lot of letters from students and professors helped a lot. My, um, I'm not a staff member here. My husband teaches at Pomona College, Tahir Andrabi. We moved here in 1988, and Tahir was the first Muslim professor at the colleges. So whenever something would happen in the Islamic world, at that time, the satanic verses had just come out, and um, a voice from the Muslim world needed to be heard. Uh, my husband was always called upon, and uh, he's an economist, so <laughs> he'd be defending uh, the Muslim, uh, the religion, the actions of the entire Muslim world. And um, for many years, when we had uh, we started having the Muslim uh, the Friday prayers, and Tahir would be often called upon to deliver the sermon. And uh, he's, since he's an economist, most of his sermons would be on demographics or poverty in the Islamic world. <laughs> or <laughs> so, um, although he is um, very well, uh, well versed in the religion, also. But and then if uh, any issues arrived with the students, um, I would step in as their de facto mom or chaplain and uh, advocate for them. So, um, but there was there, we did need this position. Um, I mean, um, I always felt that the students needed uh, to have a Muslim chaplain here. And when my daughter went to um, college at Swarthmore um, a few years back, there it's a very small college, and they had a Muslim chaplain. So that's when I just realized how helpful it was for her and what we were denying the students over here. So that is when I really started pushing for it. And the first letter that I got was from the first Muslim judge in California who used to be a student at Pomona. Um, he was my husband's student. And he said, well, California has its first Muslim judge and we are still waiting for the Muslim chaplain at the colleges. So um, we received um, very strong letters from students who'd graduated 20 years back, 10 years back. I particularly remember one uh, from a girl who was very, who's very close to me now. She's a surgeon at Mass General, went to Harvard for um, uh, medicine. And she arrived uh, after 9-11. So, and she used to wear the hijab. And um, she said that I am just, um, I'm a student. I'm, I'm an artist, I'm a writer. I cannot, this, this, as a student, I'm carrying the weight of this entire religion. I have to answer for everybody, and that's too much for a student. And similarly, I, um, uh, the, for the Muslim faculty, this was um, the faculty who are teaching other things other than religion. It's, it was an extra job that we just took over because uh, there was this vacuum. And, um, so, um, I, and I was delighted, of course, to um, be able to welcome Adil here, um, who has um, been, who has done way beyond our expectations, and the students are delighted. So let me get to um, telling you a little bit about Adil. Um, he's an interfaith scholar <laughs> and a frequent speaker. He uh, currently serves as the co-university chaplain at the Claremont Colleges before coming to Claremont. In 2016, he was the Muslim chaplain, director of Muslim life at Duke University. He has also served as the Muslim chaplain imam at Wesleyan Trinity College and American Unis University, among uh, uh, others. And uh, I would like to highlight that Imam Adil Zaib is the president-elect of the National Association of College and University Chaplains. Um, and and I understand that this is the first Muslim chaplain who, is that right, Adil? This is the first Muslim chaplain who's been elected as the president of the National Association of Colleges and University Chaplains. And he has given lots of Friday khutbahs at the, uh, uh, at the Capitol Hill in the State Department, mosques nationally, and he has been featured at CNN, NPR, Washington Post, Time Magazine, Huffington Post. Um, I could go on and on, but let's welcome Imam Adil Zeb. Okay. 
so the mic is good? The oh, mic's real good. Okay, good. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, before we formally start, uh, I think the slide is up of my uh, social media. Uh, I think part of uh, this presentation is building connections and keeping in touch, and so I do, um, almost to an addiction, uh, post on these different, uh, it's not all of them, but like a lot of them, right? I mean, Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, but Instagram, you know, stuff. And uh, so please do uh, find me the same, same handle there. So I want to start off with a question. When you think of a Muslim in America, what pops into your mind? When you think of a Muslim in general, what pops into your mind? And then when you think of a Muslim in America, an American Muslim, a Muslim American, a Muslim in America, what pops to your mind? Any of these people? Recognize any of these people? Maybe, maybe some of them, depending on your age and your background, like, right? So that's Ice Cube on the top right, on my top right, who is a very famous rapper uh, from NWA and then moved on to his, o his own uh, production. And then uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, who has now moved up in the Democratic National Committee. Um, and then, of course, Muhammad Ali, who uh, uh, recently passed away. May God have mercy on his soul, right? And Ibn Hajj Muhammad, right, who was an um, Olympian uh, fence, fencist, uh, fence, someone who does fencing, um, right? And, uh, you know, these people are in the main American, the mainstream American uh, viewpoint. You, you, you see them, you, we interact with them, but sometimes we forget that they're Muslim. But you'll notice that each of them have vocally, in some way, shape, or form, vocalized, expressed that they are Muslim, right? Ice Q has done that. Congressman Keith Ellison, he swore on the Quran as opposed to the Bible when he was sworn into Congress, right? Muhammad Ali obviously was very vocal about his being Muslim until even his, his uh, final stages. Uh, even after his, his death, many people came out to his funeral, Muslims, non-Muslims. You know, Bill Clinton was there. It was, it was, a, big, it was a big event, right? And Hajj obviously as well, you know, and she's wearing the headscarf, the hijab, um, while she was in the Olympics. Um, this person you may not know is Dr. Ingrid Mattson. She is a Canadian convert to Islam, and she is the former president of the Islamic Society of North America, which is the largest uh, Muslim organization in America. And she is also the founder of the Islamic Chaplaincy Program at Hartford Seminary which was the first and only accredited Masters of Divinity MDiv equivalent in North America. And so she's really a pioneer, and she was also one of my mentors and teachers as well. And so when I studied with her at seminary, I, for the first time, I had a female teacher uh, teaching religious studies. Before that, it was, you know how, you know the drill, right? It's all men quoting men, quoting men, written by books by men, quoting a man. And when I learned from her, it opened my eyes and my soul and my heart to a perspective of over half of the population that I hadn't received before through a spiritual lens. So I'm really grateful for her and I wanted to kind of highlight that as well. I've got some more Muslims. Um, so you, may, you probably know the guy on the top right, right? And so I usually model my hairstyle after him when I go to the uh, barber shop. <laughs> But that's, no, obviously Zayn Malik, uh, he's, not, he's not American, right? But it's still a, a point to drive home. And the Oz show, um, Dalia Magahed, and there's some Indian, Indonesian Muslims as well. And so I bring up these different faces of, uh, of Islam, or Muslims if you like, to show the diversity of Muslims, um, culturally, gender, um, age range, and professions. Do you think about this picture when you think about Muslims in America? Ever thought about Muslims being Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, right? Selling cookies on the streets and for $100 a box, right? <laughs> in Claremont Village and whatever else, right? So thinking about um, that component as well. Okay, so you may recognize this young man um, flying in the air. That's my mother and that's me when I was a kid. And um, I bring up this picture for a variety of reasons. Um, one is my mother, she immigrated to this country, uh, to America, and is now a citizen. Um, my father did as well. 
And uh, I, was, I was born and raised in the States. And uh, I don't know where we are at this moment. Um, but I, I bring up this picture for that one, first reason. The second reason is that my mom is currently in Pakistan. And she's been there for, I think, one or two months now. And she, I think, has just left right after that recently. The, the ban started for the different countries. And so I was freaking out. I was like, Mom, just come back home. Just come back home. Because I was like, I don't know what's going to be next. Like, is Pakistan going to be the next country on the list? You know, I was preparing for this lecture. And then the, my, my wife told me, and then the, I saw on the new, on CNN breaking news that there's now like a Muslim laptop ban, right? So you, you can't go to this like eight Muslim majority country with your laptop on the plane. And obviously it's a far flight. So you're planning on going, it's a long time without an iPad or, or a laptop to do your work or to view things, right? So I, I worry about, and I still worry about her until hopefully she's coming home, I think, in the next few days. Um, but I worry about that. And then, Obviously, I'm a, just a young child here, but I also started to experience, I think at the age of eight, a lot of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry. Um, growing up in a suburb of Dallas, I was called a lot of these names. I was called the sand N-word. I was called towel head. I was called camel jockey. And you can imagine what that does to a young, a young child's mentality, right? And mental, mental, um, wellness and emotional wellness. And it was at that early age where I realized that, okay, I'm not like everybody else, right? My name is Adil Zaib. I have tan skin and I grew up in a household. My parents' primary language was not English. And so I'm having to learn as a firstborn, my family having to learn not only the culture, but the language as well. I didn't know how to say his different words at school. I was trying to figure out, and all my classmates would be like, oh, that's a very easy word. Words like ma'am, you know, M-A apostrophe A-M. It's very, you know, now we know it, but at the time I was like, what is this word? But all my, college, all my fellow students know the word very easily, but I have to learn and pick it up. So I want to highlight that when you're, when you're either um, an international uh, student or an immigrant or your parents from different countries, you have to learn a lot of the, of the culture and nuance. And then students, now, younger students now, um, which I'll get into later in the talk, but younger students now, post 9-11, have new names called to them. And then they have Taliban, then Osama, Al-Qaeda, and now ISIS, and different types of names for terrorists are, are being um, given and labeled to them. Also, who knows this person? Anybody like 30 plus, right, will know who this person is, right? So this is, <laughs> everyone's aging, right? Um, so this is Zach, um, and he was, uh, you know, from Saved by the Bell, was a very famous uh, figure when we were growing up. Again, when I went to get a haircut, I would try to get a haircut like him, right? <laughs> Do my hair like him, dress like him. I thought he was like the coolest guy in, in, the, in the street. But I also realized that Zach has a lot of privilege because he's a white male, and a white male from an affluent family. And he was able to get away with a lot of troublemaking on the TV show. He pulled all these pranks. He was always like almost suspended. But I wonder if Zach was Latino or if he was black, would he get the same amount of privilege in school? Or if he was Asian or if he was Muslim, right? Would he get the same amount of privilege at school? This is a picture of Bilkis. Bilkis has the record for scoring the highest number of points in Massachusetts basketball, high school basketball. LeBron James actually tweeted to her as well. That's, and that's like, you know, LeBron James, right? Um, I bring this point up because she is banned from playing international basketball because she wears the headscarf, right? So when we're talking about the Muslim ban, it's not just about the seven countries that, and six now, I guess, that were banned uh, coming in and the refugees. That's there, that's horrible. It's not just about this new laptop ban. It's, it hits different levels, right? And now this person, because she chooses to wear an extra piece of head covering, can't play international basketball. 
even though she'd be a great asset for the US if she has the highest number of points, right? That's like, that could help us get the gold. So I think to Shella's point, after 9-11, Muslims became walking press conferences. And we're, we're, the mics were like shoved literally into our face. I have some friends who were at the um, Islamic Center of New York University, and they were college students. They had the same age as students who are here right now and who attend the colleges. And they had to go on national media. And they had to talk about, what's your response? Because they live so close to the ground zero location. So the spotlight was on them, right? And that's a very, very difficult people to have, um, experience people to have. Now, if you look at this, um, this, this slide here, we're gonna talk, this is all, this is all pre, uh, this is all uh, after 9-11 now, kind of going into the, the timeline. Um, you'll see first class, you have like one person there, and you have uh, economy, you have first class, and you have economy class over here, okay? More people. Then you have the Muslim class, right? And it's, it's funny, but it's also very sad, satire, because um, that's how it was. I can tell you my own experiences, being 20 or so, tw being my 20s, post 9-11, being of Pakistani origin, what kind of nonsense I had to go through personally. I came on a flight on Pakistan International Airlines into the States, and there was a flight from some European country. Everybody on the Pakistani flight was stuck into this large auditorium. And everybody on the European flight went straight into customs. And we had to go and wait in line by honor system. Then we would get up and go and talk to the person the front, at the front. They asked, where did you visit? What languages do you speak? And so after a while, I'm like, forget this. So I go to the I go to security guard after I'm leaving, and I'm like, can I ask you a question? It's like two or three hours later. My mom and my sisters are worried about me. Like, where is the deal? What's going on? I ask them a question. I say, is there a reason why everybody on this Pakistani flight is in this huge auditorium, and everybody in the European flight's not there? And he says, to be honest with you, we're looking for Osama bin Laden, so we have to, you know, meet, meet everybody here on this flight. And so that goes into the point about if you're trying to stop terrorism and do it evidence-based, don't profile an entire people or religion or community for it. And this question, is America Islamophobic? Right. <laughs> right, and this I think came out in 2010, I wanna say, right? Is America Islamophobic, right? And then, you know, it's maybe 50-50, and then, you know, and then you get into the, the, the post-President uh, post Trump era, you may have a different kind of an answer. This is also post-9-11, but um, before, um, before President Trump's election, 2010. So you see, this is from the FBI. Uh, FBI is Islam training documents. So it has the militancy consideration. If you look over here, the person who, um, reads the Torah and is adherent to the, uh, and is pious and devout, okay, um, is gonna be nonviolent, very peaceful, great person, you know, all good stuff. A person who follows the Bible, adherent and pious and devout, is peaceful and wonderful, nonviolent, great. A person who studies the Quran and adheres and is pious and devout is violent. So you see how if the FBI is getting trained like this, and then the FBI is, and this is in LA Times, I'm not making it up, you can check it out, they are recruiting and hiring informants, informants who are going to the mosque and who are promoting, recruiting people to become terrorists so they can tap them and they can send them to jail. This also happened in Houston, Texas, where um, an informant took Muslims camping, recorded the conversation, and got them to say things that against America. They were gonna go, go over there, we're gonna attack America, and got them on tape. And I know because I was at the court when I saw one of the people uh, in, uh, who was entrapped in cuffs, and he's in, in prison now. Right. And the gentleman, oh, gentleman, <laughs> the informant um, in LA what he did was the FBI told him that they gave him $80,000 salary. 
uh, to be an informant, and I think he was, a, it was, um, he was a former inmate, and they said, if it helps you, you can date Muslim women to get into the community. And the Muslim community was very suspicious about this because he would come to like the first morning prayer an hour early and just park his car before the mosque opened, right? But I'll just give you an example of the, the tension that is in the Muslim community with the FBI, right? It, it, it's a very real tension that we want people to protect us, but we don't want people to profile us. How many of you have heard the term of Sharia? Okay. Right, so Sharia is it's a very, very commonly used term. It's usually used to um, scare people uh, tremendously. Um, and then you have this uh, research where 32 states have introduced legislation to ban the non-existent threat of Sharia law from being used in their courtrooms. So you see how many bills are being introduced. I think it's like the lighter pink, the, uh, the salmon color, and the ones that are signed in law is a darker, is a darker color, right? Um, and then never introduced, no surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. So. Um, when we talk about this, right, we have to understand, first of all, constitutionally, it's impossible to establish Sharia law or Jewish law or blue law or golden law, any kind of religious law into America because separation of church and state. So if it's indeed impossible, then what is the point? Why do you establish an anti-Sharia bill if it's impossible in the first place? It's to establish fear and to establish bigotry. Right? And what the Quran says, La ikraha fi din is the Arabic. It's in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the second uh, surah or segment of the Quran. It says that there is no compulsion in religion. That actually in the Sharia, in the Quran, in the Sharia, it prohibits Muslims for establishing Sharia to non-Muslims. Does that make sense? I can say it again. In the Sharia, it prohibits Muslims for, to establish Sharia with non-Muslims. We can't force religion upon anyone. That's what, it's in the Quran. Now, Americans' acquaintance and the favorability of Muslims. If you look and you see this, um, I know some Muslims very well, you'll see the difference in the opinion of people. 59%, 78%, 82%, this is Republicans are, are red, Democrats are blue, Independents are the yellow color, right? I know some Muslims fairly well, it goes down, right? I don't know any Muslims. See how unfavorable, right? So the point of this is that you know, the more that you interact with Muslims, uh, the more people are going to have a more favorable opinion, right? And if that indeed is the case, then they're not these scary monsters and gremlins that we're seeing um, in the news. Now, if you see um, the center, 2016, the Center for a Study of Hate and Extremism, from California State University, San Bernardino, right across the street, right? You'll see the number of anti-Islamic incidents um, rose 78% from 2014 to 2015. The number of anti-Arab incidents rose 219%, right? So it really is just kind of further um, affirming that there is a problem. Because believe it or not, that question, is America Islamophobic, was actually a question before the inauguration and the election. People really were like, ah, is it really? I don't know, right? Okay, so now this is a $57 million network that's fueling Islamophobia in, in America. Now I'll break it down and go through these slides quickly. But you'll see one of them I wanted to mention was the Clarion Project. Do you know where the Clarion Project's located? Claremont, California, kind of, kind of sad, <laughs> right? Um, but you'll see different people and different amounts of money, and you can see this online. If you Google like Fear Inc. Um, Islamophobia report or PDF, you can, you can check the whole report online. And then you have the different people who are involved, right? Daniel Pipes and um, Robert Spencer, Steve Emerson, Frank Gaffney. You could probably add some more to the list now. Bannon, Trump, right? So, and then here you have the validators. Validators are like Muslims who they get to come on television to say that there's an issue, right? So if you get a Muslim to be like, yeah, there's a big issue with Muslims being radicalized in America. I'm Muslim, believe me, right? Um, that's kind of their game. So they'll find Muslims who will come on television 
or they'll find like former Muslims um, who've had bad experiences, who've also done that as well, Pamela Geller, um, the list kind of goes on. Then you have people who from the religious right community who also um, say very horrible things. I had an experience with Franklin Graham myself in when I was at Duke University, the chapel staff invited the Muslims to do the call to prayer, the adhan, from the chapel bell tower. The press release was released and Franklin Graham, um, son of Billy Graham and Fox News teamed together and issued an ultimatum. And they said that if you're a donor and or alum of Duke, call Duke and tell them to cancel the call to prayer or we'll take our money away. So they called, they emailed, the law school, the basketball team, everybody was getting inundated with calls to cancel the, to, and we got media coverage from all across the world. Now, what we didn't see coming was the death threats. So people were literally ready to kill the students. Like we got voicemail, it was so sad. Students and staff, and it was, it was just so sad to hear those voicemails, don't repeat them, but it was, it was very intense time. And so there's a, there's a struggle that you have to figure, you have to be, you wanna be pluralistic, but if you wanna be pluralistic, is it worth your life or the, the safety of your family or the students that you're shepherding? And then there's different political players as well, elected officials who are also kind of part of this, part of this network and different <coughs> grassroots organizations. And of course, uh, media, a lot of Fox News people are here, right? Um, and different uh, players and uh, media outlets. Huh. So this picture is from Maria. Maria is the young girl depicted here. This is from uh, New York Times. And this is a Lebanese American family. And the father is comforting her because she's having dreams that Donald Trump is coming to get her. And this is before the election. And so he's kind of, you know, talking to her, trying to make her feel better. Because now, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the, the level of, of bullying and the emotional um, toll is far, it, it, it's, it's, it's far more heavy now because of all of these factors. So this is the only picture I have of Agent Orange. Um, so <laughs> please, uh, please forgive me after this. Uh, but only one, because we have to do it. But, you know, the shutdown of Muslims entering, of, uh, of refugees not being able to come in, um, you know, this really caused um, an actualization of the fear, right? It's because we, we're always hearing politicians saying either really great things or really scary things, but when it's actualized, that's when it's like, oh my goodness, are we gonna be okay? or is something really crazy going to happen? You know, and this, um, if you look at this, I think this is, it's a young man, he says, I'm a, re I am a Yemeni refugee and I'm scared, right? And you, know, you can imagine how hard it is for someone to come, when you're a refugee, you're seeking refuge from something. Something really bad happened where you were living. Somebody probably died in your family, a lot of your family probably died, your city was being destroyed, you're constantly in fear. And you finally get to go somewhere that's the land of opportunity, liberty, hope, safety, all of this, right? And then this happens and says, actually, <laughs> you can't come in, right? And that's a reality. And it's a reality for a lot of our students here, whether they're students who are undocumented whether they're students in the DACA program, whether they're students who are international students, whether they're Muslim students, a lot of students are feeling this in different levels. And there's different levels within the Muslim community of privilege. There's Muslims who are uh, born and raised citizens, there's Muslims who are converts, there's Muslims who are green card holders, Muslims who are visa holders. And the Muslim students who are visa holders, I don't know if you know, but they don't have a right to an attorney. So if they go, they don't have a right to an attorney being there. They don't have a right to make a phone call. So their parents could be waiting there for hours. They could be starved. And what's happening is um, the government is, is the make, there's diff different cases that have happened already where the government asked them to sign forms. If you want to go, if you want to leave and not be detained indefinitely, sign this form releasing your visa or your green card. And they don't know what to do because they don't have access to their phone. They don't have an attorney. Their parents are worried about them. They haven't talked to them in three hours. This is the reality we're living in right now. ICE. ICE has been a problem since I don't know when. I used to work on ICE cases as a congressional staffer. And at that point, 
You know, we had, we had different people in our district. And so right now, the Latino community is really suffering with this. I mean, Huntington Beach, ICE is coming. They're coming to the Starbucks. They're coming to meet kids coming back from school. This is horrible, right? And when I was working as a staffer, you know, they, were, they were coming for South Asians. They were coming from Indians, Pakistanis, Muslims. They come after everybody. And they're not nice about it. And the problem is, is that after the, with this administration, they have um, less accountability. And so now they're empowered to even go, out, out, go, go after people harder. And they usually hire, um, they have a, have a high rate of hiring veterans who have the military experience. So, and and we, we appreciate and we love veterans, but, um, but in this context, they're coming into a situation where they are encouraged to be a bit more militaristic in their approach. Um, and Standing Rock, you know, this picture is taken there, you know, and you'll find many people from vulnerable communities came together and were like, this is not okay. And so we all started checking in on Facebook, right, saying that we're there because we didn't want the police to come and figure out who was there and who wasn't there. Because this is something that, you know, I think we as Americans, um, we sometimes forget about is how much uh, our system and our structure has hurt and continues to hurt the Native American community, right? And so when we're talking about making America great again, are we really making America great again or are we going backwards and hurting America again? We're not, going back, not going to our original values. This, um, so Serial is a podcast um, that is about a young Pakistani American male um, whose I think ex-girlfriend was murdered and he was found guilty for the murder, was in trial for the murder. This is actually a TV show, The Night Of. How many of y'all have seen The Night Of TV show? I would highly recommend watching this show. Um, it's, it's a story about a Pakistani American um, son of immigrants, much like I guess my, my story to a point. Um, and then he sees a nice young lady and they spend the night together and the next morning he wakes up and she's dead. And then he gets blamed for the murder and so on and so forth. But I think it's a really good uh, story to, to take a look into and see how the, the um, prison industrial system, we, we, we sometimes profile it, right? It's, it's, only going, uh, it's not going after us, it's only going after um, black people or Latinos. It's going after everybody. And Latinos and black people are American, and we're all together in this. So any times we, we see people who are suffering, we need, and who are treated un unjustly, we need to speak out against that as Americans. This article came out in Newsweek. The right-wing extremists are a bigger threat to America than ISIS. And you see this, my gosh, this young girl has a gun in her hand. It's probably as tall, almost as tall as her, as, as tall as her, and this young boy, who's almost being indoctrinated, seeing his father with the gun, or at least like a fatherly figure with a gun, right? But you don't see any kind of a ban to European countries. You only see it to Muslim-majority countries. Well, why is that, right? What's, what's really going on here, right? And we talk, and people have mentioned, you know, the idea of Islam versus the West. Islam is a religion, West is a direction, <laughs> right? Okay, and then what does that say about Muslims who are black and Muslim, who have fought and I will say died, died for civil rights, not just for Muslims, not just for black people, but for all Americans. What does that say when you say something like Islam and the West? What does that say to people like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali who didn't die for that, but he sacrificed a lot for that. He sacrificed the heavyweight championship of the world, and he sacrificed the best years of his career because he didn't want to go overseas and kill another people of color, especially when people of color were being persecuted in his own country. Now, what happened after the ban? You saw so many people coming in to JFK, O'Hare, DFW, SFO, Seattle, Boston, Dulles, Denver, LAX, Ontario, right, uh, coming in and saying this is not going to happen. You saw attorneys coming in 
and Muslims were sending them pizza, and you know, people were praying at the airport. Okay, for you all to understand, praying at the airport is a really awkward and a big deal if you're a Muslim. Really awkward and a really big deal. Because when I go to the airport, generally speaking, if I'm praying in the airport, a security guard will come and watch me, come right next to me and watch me. Or, I'll tell you one example quickly, I was with a friend of mine, name happens to also be Adil, and we happened to be at the same flight, I don't know how it happened, it just happened, and um, we were, it's time for the first prayer, it's an early morning flight, so we pray, and we're already past security, we're like at the, you know, at the, at the gate, so we get to the gate, and they say stop, randomly, randomly selected, yes. okay, it's both of us? Yes, okay, so then they check our bags, and they ask my friend, they say, uh, so did y'all come together for this flight? And he said, no, it's just about as random as this search. <laughs> right? And then I was taking a lot of interfaith classes at seminary that year. And so I, am, uh, I had like a, this Jewish book about this thick. I had like Christology, I had the Bible in there. And so I was like, what are you going to find in there? <laughs> right? Because they're obviously trying to profile to find something. And so, you know, when this, uh, the airport protest happened, Muslims were praying, and, pe and the rest of Americans were guarding the Muslims in the prayer, right? And that's beauty. That's the America that we want to see happen. This is not the America we want to see happen. How many of y'all have seen this show, The Man in the High Castle? Okay, so if you don't know what this show is, um, and if you're like scared of the Trump administration, don't watch this show until its administration is, uh, you know, has reached its term. Um, and the reason why is because in this show, um, the Nazis and the Japanese win World War II and take over America. And so the northeast part of America is under Nazi, Nazi uh, occupation. And all of the policies of Nazi Germany become normalized. It's normal. So it's horrific that Jewish people are killed. If you're disabled, you are put to death. If you are not of the white Aryan race, you cannot live in New York or the East Coast, right? These policies are normalized. People don't think twice about it. And so when the first time we had people, when the, the ban first came out, people went to the airports. It was like, oh, thank God. America's got our back. When the second ban came out, People weren't hitting the airports anymore. So then you start getting scared. Is this becoming normalized? Are people having that activist fatigue where it's just, I want to help, but I'm kind of tired now. It's too much. And then 10 years from now, four years from now, oh yeah, Muslims can't come to America. What are we talking about? That's like, that's like 1980s, man. What are you talking about? Right? That was a long time ago. So it becomes normalized. I think that's something that I personally am still fearful of. Okay, this last picture of me, I'm sorry about that. So this is a picture of me, if you can see it or not. I'm at Lambeau Field, right? Lambeau, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. And so uh, I'm at Lambeau Field. I'm actually on the field. This is not a green screen. This is, this happened. My wife is here. She was there witnessing that. So, um, and <laughs> this football is actually in my office right now. If you ever come, come and see it, my, in McAllister. Um, and so I bring this up because even though all these struggles are happening, we're still going to have fun and we're still going to live our lives. We're still going to watch football. We're still going to watch Netflix. We're still going to go shopping. We're still going to be on Snapchat. And we're still going to be in Marvel comic books. Right? We're still going to have Muslim women as our superheroes. Some of them covered like that. Some of them not covered like that. Doesn't really matter because Muslim women express themselves in different ways. They have Muslim, the Green Lantern, the newest one is Muslim, I think uh, is a Muslim. This other guy, I don't know who he is. He's probably B-team, so I don't know who he is yet, but we'll, we'll figure it out, uh, his name. And then I think after the ban, what also happened was Muslims were, it's intrinsic in our ethos to be inclined towards social justice. And I wanted to read this quote of the Prophet Muhammad that he said, if any one of you sees something objectionable, one should change it with one's hand. But if one cannot, one should do it with one's tongue. And if one cannot with, um, with one's tongue, one should feel it in one's heart. 
and doing it only in the heart is the weakest form of faith. And so you find Muslims are very much attached to social justice causes, right? When Black Lives Matter, um, as that name was emerging, Muslims were on the forefront of, of wanting to support that, support that movement. And of course you have black Muslims who are part of both identities, both communities. You have um, Ilham Omar, who was actually a refugee herself and became the first Somali-American um, state senator in, uh, in Minnesota, right? And you see her story. And you see if you ban people from coming in, then you miss out from people like this emerging. Right? And then you see Muslims at the Women's March, right? Proudly being there, part of that, because they're Muslim and they're also women. And they're also standing up for women's rights and their identities. Muslims helping out the Jewish cemeteries that were vandalized, raising $150,000 to help Jewish cemeteries. And their goal was $20,000 to repair, and they raised $150,000 for the cemeteries. Right? And I'll, I'll close with, with this, in that you know, Nelson Mandela was reported to have said, I myself am weak, and, and you are weak, and you are weak, and you are weak, and you are weak. But together we are strong. Right? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I remember when um, three young Muslims were shot in Chapel Hill, and um, it was a very tense time, obviously. We had to call the prayer controversy, then we had the Chapel Hill shootings. And, um, Loretta Lynch, the former Attorney General, she came to Durham, and we had a big round table meeting, 70 people or so, a huge table. And I told her, I said, Muslims are being killed, Muslims who, and, then, and black people are being killed, and no one's saying anything. No, and there's no repercussions. People are getting off free, they're going to court, and they're, they're not guilty for the, for the killings. What's going on? and it's not called a hate crime. How can we stop this? She said, she first validated what's happening. Then she said, it takes everybody at this table to say something and do something to cause a change to happen. That's why it takes everybody here to speak out, to attend protests, to fundraise, to cause a change to happen, an effective and positive change. That's how we are going to move forward. And if you ever think about the process of how gold is created, chemicals and melting and adding all these things, it's a very rough process. It takes time, work, effort. But at the end, you have gold. At the end, you have gold. So we can come together and make this country golden. And no matter what your age is, young people, the millennials right now, the younger millennials, they already are helping us become better because they don't look at the world, a lot of them, through racist eyes, or through xenophobic eyes, or through eyes of bigotry. They see individuals, right? So I want to close with that, and thank you for your time and listening. How are we on time for any questions? It's one o'clock? Okay, maybe five minutes for questions and people have to get to class, I think. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, reaching out to the um, Muslim Student Association and saying, hey, my name is, uh, you know, blank, and I wanted to show my support for the community. Is there a way I can get involved helping one of the events, or is there anything that I can do to, to be helpful? I think then um, they can help 
uh, direct you to uh, the appropriate avenues and, and channels. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, so both, um, both, uh, both questions were kind of like, how can you be an advocate or an ally um, as, a, as a Christian, either student or, or staff person? Um, and uh, you know, my, my direction for the first question was, you know, contact the MSA, the Muslim Student Association, and see what they, um, what they have in mind for direction. Uh, and then the second, uh, and he, his comment was, um, that you know, you may have grown up with certain things, um, heard certain things about Muslims, and if you educate yourself, oneself, about Muslims and Islam, um, then you're able to be a more equipped advocate and ally to people around you and for yourself. Any other questions? One more question, I think. Once, twice. Okay. Thank you again so much for your time.